How's it going everyone? I'm International Master Daniel Wrench. This is Chess.com's YouTube channel and this is another installment of the Chess News Worldwide. The whole purpose of these videos is to let the casual chess player, maybe the fringe player, who's kind of dabbling in the game of kings here on YouTube or maybe on Chess.com, but not necessarily totally aware of all the things going on in the world of professional chess or the world of tournament chess. So we're going to keep you up to date on the happenings and the major chess events and all the things that are, that are going on at the highest level of the game of chess. So since our last chess news video, Vichy Anand was defending his title against Boris Gelfond, which he did so successfully. We did not review any games here, but we had coverage of the match over on chess.com slash TV. And uh, congratulations goes out to Vichy Anand. The other tournament that we mentioned in our last chess news installment was the U.S. Chess Championship, which was won by Hikaru Nakamura, winning his uh, third U.S. Chess Championship title. Played a great tournament, including a huge win against Kamsky with the black pieces. So congratulations to Hikaru Nakamura for defending his title. Those two events were probably the biggest two events that were going on since our last news installment. Just recently, the U.S. Junior Championship took place, and GM Elect, currently International Master Mark Arnold, won the U.S. Junior Championship, so congratulations to him. Moving on, to give everybody a little bit of a preview of what's going on here in the month of July and maybe the remainder of the summer, we have the Beale International going on in Switzerland coming up. Magnus Carlsen is going to be there defending his title along with this cast of very strong grandmasters, including the current reigning U.S. champion Hikaru Nakamura, along with Morozovic and Anish Giri, should be pretty exciting. Is one of these guys going to take down the field or maybe the dark horse, my sleeper? That's right, you see him right there, my partner international master David Proust over on chess.com. He'll be there playing, so if you see him, say hi and uh, be sure to follow that tournament. It should be exciting. Probably going to have some live event coverage for you over on chess.com TV. Also coming up here in July, we have our next death match between Wesley So of the Philippines, currently ranked in the top 20 for juniors around the world, against the young American star Ray Robson. Ray Robson, as you can see here, both of these players are very strong. Both of them really looking excited, looking forward to the match. Excuse me, and it's going to take place July 29th, which is a Sunday at. Uh, 3 p.m. Pacific, which is going to be early in the morning the next day, July 30th, in the Philippines. So for a lot of fans of uh, the young Grandmaster Wesley So and currently the highest rated player in the Philippines, a little bit easier for them to follow the match. So we adjusted the time a little bit. Make sure you watch that death match. It's open to everybody, whether you have a Chess.com membership or not. So uh, Chess.com TV or live stream dot com slash Chesscom Live. You can find coverage of our next death match. Also going on, the uh, tournament in Dortmund, currently owned by Vladimir Kramnik, just about every year is taking place. We're going to have a game that he just won in Dortmund uh, yesterday, a really exciting game. And as you can see here, uh, Kramnik is not only the defending champion, he's won this tournament. Uh, everybody's lost track of how many times he's won this tournament. And this, as you can see in front of you, is the current standings of the Dortmund International. As you can see there, he's right at the top and uh, will probably take home the bacon once again in Dortmund. But we're going to show you an exciting win win a sort of surprising opening choice by Cram here in just a second to give you guys a little bit of chess. Um, also coming up that we want to make sure that we mention is uh, a new addition to Chess.com TV, a new author, Dan Heisman, well known for his uh, Chess.fm radio show called The Renaissance Man, where he's going to have a show over on Chess.com TV every couple weeks called Q&A with Coach Heisman. So if you're a fan of Dan Heisman and his work here on all kinds of videos and on the internet, you can follow Coach Dan Heisman now on Chess.com TV. Wanted to throw that out there. And last piece of news that I just became aware of today, kind of exciting, interesting news, is that a friend of mine and a sort of former former childhood rival in Scholastic Chess, A.J. Steigman, now an entrepreneur, sent out a chess challenge to billionaire and well-known venture capitalist Peter Thiel, owner of PayPal, owns some equity in Facebook. I'm pretty sure he's a pretty famous guy. So he sent out a match for $1 million to Peter Thiel, or if Peter Thiel wins, getting some equity in uh, Mr. Steigman's new company. So those are both former masters maybe they're both i think they're both still national masters actually owning the life master titles actually and uh both pretty strong chess players and kind of an interesting little piece of chess news sort of inspired by a uh, business article on the top chess players turned businessmen and so aj steigman has sent out a challenge to peter thiel uh we'll we'll let you guys know 
know if there's any chess.com involvement. Maybe they'll play the match online. I'm putting this out there as a potential, potential feel or maybe motivator, but that should be interesting. And uh, that's a little random piece of chess slash business news that people might be interested in. And uh, that's pretty much it as far as things I wanted everyone to be aware of and a little recap of some of the major events that happened since our last installment. And now looking ahead to July, we have all the other things we laid out here, the Beal tournament, the death match coming up. And of course, we'll see how Dortmund finishes or just wait for Kramnik to win the tournament again. And on that note, let's go ahead and move over to uh, the chessboard here and review the game by Kramnik and uh, see how he won really quickly with the black pieces. Kind of a really amazing creative game in the King's Indian. Usually Kramnik is known as a King's Indian slayer, but he actually used the King's Indian here against Jan Gustafsson. It was an exciting game. So let's go ahead and take a look at that. Now, as we said here, Vladimir Kramnik was playing the black pieces against Jan Gustafsson. Interesting game, a surprising choice by Vladimir Kramnik. King's Indian, as we said, not normally a King's Indian player, but today was a special day apparently because he was feeling it. We got a mainline Kings Indian here, nothing super special. E5, the most common move here for amateur players who may not know. The pawn is not really hanging here because if Dakes takes and Knight takes, whether you trade Queens on D8 or not, if White takes the pawn on E5, this Knight moves with a quick discovery on the undefended piece, winning back material and usually having at least equality for black. So E5, Bishop E3. Now C6 is... um. Not the most common approach these days. Knight to c6 is a common move. I believe that even knight to g4 is an interesting idea that tends to follow up this bishop e3 development, getting a lot of really sharp positions, trying to win the bishop pair. White typically follows up knight g4 with bishop g5, and the position is exciting, but this is not an opening theory lecture, so we're going to speed past this part just a little bit and get to an interesting middle game. He uh, captures on d4, he being Vladimir Kramnik, creating a Boleslavsky whole pawn structure. This is very similar to a Meroxy bind, but rather than the pawn being on e e7 or the e-file, the pawn is on the c-file. This is a Boleslavsky whole structure, which um, is uh, really dynamic. White has more space, typical in Meroxy bind uh, pawn structure here in the center. But uh, black has the open e-file, which typically is a little bit easier to use to exert pressure than, let's say, the c-file compared to a regular meroxybine in, for example, a Sicilian. And so th these positions are pretty interesting. Black is going to be aggressive on the e-file and perhaps even try to break with d5 here quickly. And, and that's exactly what happened. Perhaps Kramnik surprised his opponent with this approach. Definitely not the most modern type of King's Indian you see played very, uh, very commonly at the highest level. So... Kramnik appeared to be pretty comfortable up to rook d8, f3, immediately played d5, and all of a sudden the, positions op the position opens up, and we start to light black right away, taking advantage of this undefended bishop on e3 and creating some tactical tension here on the pawns. After takes, takes, with the knight, he's again exposing the pin. If knight takes, he can just take back with the pawn, and, and that's exactly what happened here. And now white has to find some way to create active counterplay because black is simply threatening to take here and win the pawn. White plays this nice, interesting move, rook to c1, creating pressure along the open file and increasing tactical chances there. And after a5, queen to b3, white is sort of pinning the pawn on d5 to f7. An example would be that if black captured here trying to win this pawn, he might find himself in a big hurt after the f7 pawn falls with uh, Chekalina Lashlava. So can't allow that. Instead plays a4 to attack the queen sacrificing the pawn temporarily. Note that the bishop on e3 is not capturable in this variation because the c8 bishop will hang, part of the reason why rook c1 was a useful move that I highlighted earlier. But black, interestingly enough, has enough counterplay here. And even though this bishop is not hanging right away, what you're going to notice over the next few moves is that the bishop is, is under fire constantly. And with that, the knight is therefore loose. And if the knight ever moves, the bishop on e2 behind it currently only defended by the pony on d4, might also become loose. So interesting here that Kramnik, whether it was all preparation or not, I don't know, but this was an exciting position when I was reviewing the game. I, th I found this really interesting that Kramnik sacrifices this d5, d5 pawn so willy-nilly and uh, just continues to create counterplay and develop his pieces. And White has a very hard time untangling these loose pieces without losing anything. And eventually that's why White lost the game. Plays a3. Uh, obviously, if captures here, we get another piece in the game, which might be a real problem for white with all kinds of stuff coming under fire. So he plays b3, but now we're going to see that this a3 pawn may eventually be involved in the attack, uh, potentially, of course, promoting. 
Knight to c6 is a really is a real shocker, an exclaim of Vyach, developing a piece with a tempo because it threatens to win a piece, and at the same time opening up defense for this bishop on c8. So kind of a, a piece sacrifice temporarily, uh, though though the knight though the knight will have uh, sacrificed its life in. Um, you know, for a good reason, because if the C file closes, then White uh, will actually lose this bishop on E3. And if that bishop on E3, fall, E3 falls, the knight is hanging. And if the knight is hanging, the bishop is hanging. So you kind of see that White's pieces are all really awkwardly placed here. And this move, knight to C6, though it sacrifices a piece, getting this bishop defended frees up this rook to be aggressive, and it kind of exposes the awkwardness of all White's pieces. So knight C6, a really strong move by Kramnik. Uh, White decides he can't really afford to take it. Looking at a line real quick, if takes... Rook takes e3 takes here. This would be an example of what I was talking about. Here, white remains up a pawn for the moment, but how does he defend the uh, loose knight on d4 without losing the bishop on e2? The answer is he can't. So it's just to show you one variation in terms of the purpose of this brilliant knight sacrifice with knight c6. So white retreats the knight to c2, but black immediately follows up with a smashing move, sacrificing the exchange on e3 in order to gain counterplay. And at this moment, I was just expecting bishop d4 and give the knight back, take here with check, and win the exchange. But in a variation like that, black can't really hope to win. And so Kranmik had a lot more in mind here, plays this move knight to b4, continuing to play the position down the exchange, but exposing the fact that if this a2 pawn falls, all of a sudden my a3 pawn looks like a beast, heading up the board to queen. And this bishop on g7 is sort of the uh, knife in white's gut. It can't really get rid of it, really controlling a ton of critical squares. And at some point, this bishop might pop up here pin the knight and uh, create other kinds of havoc. So white plays rook to c4, gives up the a2 pawn, hopes to coordinate the pieces quickly before this a pawn becomes a monster, but he's unable to do so. Offers a trade of rooks, probably the right decision to take off a pair of rooks, usually when you're up the exchange, but in this setting, this a pawn is just too strong. So Kranmik exchanges. Obviously, he's going to move the knight and try to queen the pawn, but before he does so, he brings the bishop in with a pin, forcing king f2. The knight backs up, and we have all kinds of threats here. Knight c2 is a threat. Knight takes d5 is a threat. a2 is a threat, and there's no way white can deal with all of it. Plays rook c1, thinking that he might postpone uh, the inevitable for just a move or so, but uh, turns out he can't even do that. Kramnik doesn't care about that bishop, says, I want the whole thing. Rook takes c8, king to g7, and here he goes. Rook comes back to c1. Queening, of course, would allow the rook to give up for the pawn, and probably we'd have a draw. But uh, Kranvik points out that he's in no rush to queen that pawn. Instead, he's going to go take advantage of the pin knight. And after rook e1, knight takes e3, white simply resigns. And this moment, if he takes d4, we queen the pawn for nothing. Moving the rook anywhere else will allow a discovered check, followed by the promotion of the pawn. And the rest, as they say, in Russia anyway, would be a matter of technique. So that was a really exciting game. Went through it kind of quickly, just highlighting the tactical nuances and um, kind of exciting just to see Kramnik use a King's Indian when he doesn't do it that often. Really reached sort of, uh, and not unorthodox, a very well-known structure in that Boleslavsky whole structure, but not a very commonly reached structure these days when we're talking about this one here. And so perhaps catching his opponent a little bit off guard with preparation, immediately lashes out with d5. And we like Black's chances really ever since. And a really brilliant game by Kramnik playing aggressive eventually sacrificing the exchange was very nice and uh, a fun one to watch. Hope you guys enjoyed it too. Hope you enjoyed this installment of Chess News and uh, we're going to see you around on Chess.com.